15. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, what Jonathan was saying was incredibly interesting because um, I know exactly what it's like to have um, a truth destroyed. I'm going to share a, a poem I wrote when I was 25, uh, by which time the landscape that sustained my childhood and my culture had been uh, completely destroyed. <clears throat> The misty path is where you lurk when you miss the past. And after years, I'm still searching for fister tags in industrial spaces. And though the chimneys don't smoke anymore, it's still hazy. Here in a city where everything fades and the cranes are erasing our memory lanes, estranged, a strain to remember in vain, the estates where I played and the memories made in a place, now a space, where a tenement slain once stood in the sky was weathered by rain and then stained by the elements. The pain, it stays reticent. It's like the council's erasing the evidence, displacing its residents. Vagrants and pensioners once made homes in the space where the Kelvin was. And it wasn't all patience and mental scars. This had a soul and a state with a Sheffield heart. And I feel a sudden bereavement, wandering gentle, screaming of underachievement, stepping on cracked glass, sullen but dreaming of concrete phantoms that I wander the streets with. They're somber, impoverished, lost and defeated by greed and the construct of hierarchical ceilings, the ominous options that a prophet conceals them. When you try and get on top of your problems, you feel them, they're gleaming, polished as you falter beneath them. The feet of aristocracy on top of them, leaving geographies of poverty, unconfident people to rot in anonymity and drop to their knees till they sob or find meaning at the bottom of reason. Me, in my grief, I embody the secrets of streets that were toppled and yet fostered a feeling of honour, proletarian, a squalor of heathens, with even the seediness embossed on my feelings. I long for a topography they conquered through leaving. A war of attrition. Resolve is then weakened as modernist blocks and their occupants yield to bureaucracy squeezes, stopping us breathing. I dream of the loss of these forgotten cathedrals and castles to cultures that hassled and sculpted me until I stood up and grappled with unction and planners' presumptions. They're baffled and stumped because they just cannot fathom how the gathering dust and the damp and the must could have massed up a love. Between the graph-covered cracks was a clandestine trust. Not in just the inanimate shrapnel of junk or a romantic nostalgia for a past that was tough, but a shabby dysfunctional family, a club, laying shattered in the fragments of the vanishing dust. I am... Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm incredible ner incredibly nervous and, and just really honoured to be here because um, I guess where I'm from... Um, is, is different to where a lot of you are from, probably. Um, I, my, my school, the year I graduated, was in the 10 lowest performing schools in the country. Uh, it's now been demolished as well. Um, but, you know, I was listening to Hannah actually talk about epigenetics and thinking of how my grandma um, picked cotton in the segregated South. So I'm in my 30s, and my grandma, Seppi Furs, picked cotton in the segregated South. And I look at, at my grandma's story and, um, and, and the way I look at my grandma is the way I'd like you to look at me. And I'm thinking, here, I, I, the reason I'm a writer is because I feel like I can express myself on the page. I, you know, my school didn't have a debating club or anything, so, so I, I'm a bit nervous about sort of not having anything to read from. Um, but I'm hoping that you look at me the way that I, I look at my grandma, there's a tradition, an African-American tradition that gives praise to the rose that blooms through a crack in the sidewalk. We can hear it in Benny King's A Rose in Spanish Harlem. We can hear it in Aretha Franklin's A Rose is Still a Rose. And we can hear it in Tupac Shakur's poem, The Rose That Grew From Concrete. And what this tradition asks us to do is to look at, uh, look at a culture or an art or a literature that manages to survive and even bloom in a place where um, nobody's asking for it to exist in a, in, in a soil that isn't fertile. And, and that's where I feel like uh, I grew up. You know, nobody asked me to write a book. Um, 
I got told off by my school teacher for using the word ubiquitous when I was seven because I had, had a love of words. Um, <laughs> the place I grew up uh, was called Firth Park in Sheffield and it was uh, named after an industrialist, Mark Firth, who built Firth Park for the workers um, who worked at his steel factory. And what generations of my family lived in Firth Park and were steel workers on my mom's side. Um, but the Firth Park I know uh, isn't this sort of traditionally white working class affair, it's a place of multiculturalism. Um, after the Second World War, when Britain was trying to rebuild itself cheaply and called on the colonies uh, for, to, to, to plug in the gap in the cheap labour market, my area suddenly became um, a home for the Yemeni community, Jamaican community, Somalian community, um, as well as the white working class community. So in the 1990s, Firth Park was um, working class, and very multicultural. And I think of my friends who uh, I grew up with, and I, I just think, God, you know, we were no United Colors of Benetton ad by any means, but we were, we were beautiful. We were, there was Thomas, one of my best friends, who was a 6'3", rugby playing white lad. There was um, Wael, Shahibe, who uh, was a Yemeni footballing genius. There was Leon Hackett, who was white, but uh, spoke better patois than any of us, because he grew up in the area of Pittsmore, uh, which is a very Caribbean area. And, and there was something coherent about our experiences together as, as poor and, and from different cultures, but we were bonded by something. And then, um, and then this happened. <laughs> um, this is me, the year Tony Blair got elected. Um, and, and I kind of, I, I read this picture and I know exactly who I was trying to be by wearing that awful shirt. <laughs> um, I was what became known in the Tony Blair years as uh, a chav. I was somebody who would... I bought this, this, uh, tea, this shirt is from uh, a place called Cromwell's Madhouse. And the great thing about that is everything was RRP, sort of 80 pounds, 90 pounds, but it was all on discounts. So, so that actually cost me eight pounds, but I told everybody that it cost me 80 pounds. And something was happening with the working class culture. You know, in, in 1989, Francis Fukuyama famously wrote his essay, uh, the End of History, which became a book in 1992. And it seems anachronistic now. It's amusing to think that, you know, it certainly wasn't the end of history. But the fall of communism was, for me, uh, the failure of the future because there was no alternative vision anymore for working-class communities. Um, there was nothing to balance neoliberal capitalism. Uh, and... Politicians stopped talking about ideas and visions and started talking about what was good for business. And I was a product of this. I, I see myself very much as part of the, the new labor generation. And, and that's what this was all about. Uh, gone, there was a whole generation where there was an absence of working class intellectuals. Unions were, were crushed. And the way we uh, could exist as people who were working class was by, by, by buying things uh, but you know, you can't build much of a culture around shopping malls and call centers. Um, and so me buying this shirt and telling everybody it was really expensive was me trying to, in a way, have a bit of social mobility. It was trying, rather than being proud of where I was from, it was kind of a way to start feeling better about, about myself and trying to elevate myself above my, uh, my surroundings. And, with Brexit, I noticed a real, I noticed a whole decade in Brexit, longer, because I noticed how what felt coherent in the 90s, and, and, and I have memories of it, of, of multiculturalism and working classness, 
Suddenly there was a fracture between being working class and being multicultural. And it came about in... Um, It came about, I think, as New Labour came to power. And Marc Augier talks about how, talks about non-places. And then you had Alex Garland's The Beach and then The Movie. And then uh, a very formative book for me was, was Pico Ayer's Global Soul. And there was sort of conception that the world was coming together. But it was only for people who could afford to come together. Marc Augier talks about non-places as hotel lobbies, and uh, business lounges and uh, international airports. And so during the new labor years, it seemed like multiculturalism was attached to global business, to globalization. And the notion of the multicultural had left working classness behind. And when I look at my friends now, they are completely fragmented. Whale has become, he, he was, He's Muslim, but has become very, very devout. He's, he's much closer to Islam than he ever was before. Um, my friend Thomas joined the EDL and is a really staunch supporter of uh, Nigel Farage. Um, my friend Kieran uh, is in prison. And we would, this beautiful moment was absolutely crushed by this divide in the stories that we're telling ourselves about who we are and who can take part in this great global idea and, and who can't. I, I wanna... It, it, I wasn't gonna share this, but this weekend um, I came across this what I see is a real relic of New Labour, actually, um, and it's the Idler Book of Crap Towns, uh, the 50 worst places to live in the UK, and it was produced in 2003. And it's so, you know, it, it's, it's an era where Matt Lucas and Sasha Baron Cohen, who went to private school together, created Vicky Pollard and Ali G. Um, it's, it's this era of mocking of, of the working class by by left-wing liberals in lots of ways, you know? Um, Owen Jones talks about it in, in his book, Chavs, where he mentions how, you know, he'd be around a group of friends and if they said anything that was racist or, you know, if they, if they use any, any homophobic language, they'd be kicked out of the group straight away, him and his Oxford, Oxford pals. But they'd be happy using the word chav. So, again, there was this cosy multiculturalism that was going on, and then a divorce from working classness. And I find this, this book, The Idler Book of Crap Towns, who, the person who set up The Idler went to Cambridge, and so did Sam Jordison, who also um, edited the book. Um, and then I was looking through it, and I was thinking, wouldn't it be interesting to see how in 2003, when uh, this sort of new labor arrogance was around and people felt comfortable making a book of crap towns, um, it'd be interesting to see how many of those crap towns voted to leave the European Union, if there's a correlation there. And I haven't had time to do the research or anything, but I thought it was really interesting to look at what was number one in crap towns. And it's, it's Hull, whose logo is the gateway to Europe. Hull voted overwhelmingly to leave the European Union. Um, and in it, uh, somebody writes, Hull smells of death. And it's interesting because the person who wrote that, his name has a certain stench too, a stench of, of privilege. Finley Coots Britain is his name. Um, and it says here, the city of Hull, isolated from the rest of the country by the Humber estuary, has had more than its fair share of social deprivation and tragedy. It suffered terribly during World War II. A large proportion of its traditional industries have since collapsed. Uh, unemployment rates are high, as are crime and heroin addiction levels. It is, however, increasingly successful with a busy shopping and cultural centre, and it contains a large, thriving student population. And it does remind me of, of the moment where I started to notice a little bit of disjuncture among my friends, where 
we try and go out. I dropped out of college and we tried to go out in Sheffield. And uh, you needed an NUS card to get into all the best spaces. And it was like this psychic, ge there was this geography for a certain type of Sheffielder and then a, a geography for us, two Sheffields completely divided. And so what I'm doing with my work is I'm trying to work towards, I guess, a kind of multiculturalism 2.0 and I'm trying to place multiculturalism back into the heart of uh, the working class imagination. I'm trying to water those concrete ro ro uh, roses, and rather than picking them out of, uh, of, of where they are, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to nourish them where they sit, which is what I think we all should be doing. Thank you very much. Thank you.